Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly talk show podcast in which we cover any topic we feel like about the Beatles, any part about their past, the present, sometimes even the future. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the regular co-hosts of the show. You might know me from my other Beatles program, which is a syndicated show called The Beatles Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my three regular co-hosts. First of all, the man who writes, he's a contributing writer for Billboard.com, also for Access, A-X-S, Dot com, and that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. Also, we have the executive editor for Beatle Fan Magazine, and that is Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And also a contributing writer for Beatle Fan and a freelance writer. He spent many years working in the classical department at the New York Times, still occasionally writes for them, as well as the Wall Street Journal and lots of other publications. And that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. And once again, we bring back a special guest to the program, that being Kit O'Toole. Kit is the author of several books of interest to Beatle fans, one of which is called Songs We Were Singing, Guided Tours to the Beatles' Lesser Known Tracks, and more recently, a book on Michael Jackson called Michael Jackson FAQ. And every now and then, we need to bring a female onto the show to... <laughs> Keep the men in check here. What? So we've been told. And uh, we welcome Kit to the show. Hi, Kit. Hi, Ken. Hello, gentlemen. And hello, everyone. Want to run for president? Yeah. <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen, who came in? Oh. <laughs> On the show today, uh, we've got a main topic to get to, which has to do with Apple and what we feel they have done right in order to uh, protect and preserve the Beatles' legacy. And we will get to that in just a few moments. But before we do that, there is yet but another major passing that we have to take note of. And it's someone near and dear to us in the Beatle world, and that being Leon Russell. Leon, uh, an extremely talented man, extremely talented musician, played a variety of instruments, probably best known for the piano. Great uh, arranger and conductor, had a long career in the music business, session man. Um, we know about his connection with the Beatles, especially with George Harrison in participation with the concert for Bangladesh. And a lot of great music that he recorded by himself. I want to get everyone's take here. And I'll, I'll also, uh, at the very end, tell you my thoughts about Leon. But uh, why don't we start with um, Alan, your thoughts on Leon Russell. Um, well, you know, I mean, he had, uh, apart from his session work, which, um, you know, I really sort of knew about only recently, you know, seeing his name turn up on credits that I had never noticed before and, and thinking, wow, that's, wow, that's Leon Russell. Um, mm -hmm. I had known him mainly, you know, through the concert for Bangladesh and, um, and his solo albums that came out just around that time and, and afterwards. And, you know, he had that, he had that really sort of great bluesy down home vocal and piano style, um, that uh, that really was, you know, when you think about the concert for Bangladesh, I mean, his work on it is one of the signature elements. You know, it just stands out um, all through. And um, so, yeah, I mean, he was a, a, a great character and, um, you know, didn't follow his work really that closely. But, um, you know, his work there was was exceptional. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing about the concert for Bangladesh is while the artist is George Harrison and Friends, the Friends part played just a big a part in, in that concert as George Harrison did. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. Bob Dylan sure. was such a major part of the, of the show, as was Leon. Ringo was there. Eric Clapton, although he didn't get to do one of his songs. But uh, it really was overall a collaborative show with all those different artists. Um, Al, how about you? Well, as a matter of fact, a lot of those uh, those singers that were in the background were recruited by Leon 
for that show because if you remember, it was only about uh, maybe a year and a half before that uh, that Leon had uh, uh, pulled together the uh, Mad Dogs and Englishmen tour for Joe Cocker. Mm-hmm. Uh, including taking a bunch of people that had been part of Delaney and Bonnie and Friends, and, uh, and you know, including Rita Coolidge and Claudia Lanier and and various others. And uh, uh, of course, as Alan mentioned, uh, Leon had been a session uh, man in the mid in the mid sixties. He wasn't really part of the you know the Wrecking Crew, but yes, he uh, was. Yes, he was. Was he? Was he yep. actually a part yes, of the Wrecking yes, Crew? Yeah. Okay. Yes, he All was. Right. Yes, he yep. was. But he he did a, a lot of session work. Everybody from from Sinatra to well, the, I mean the most obvious one, obviously being Gary Lewis, uh, mm-hmm. where he either co-wrote or arranged all of his major hits that had also yep. been produced by uh, by Snuff Garrett, and uh, he was also part of the house band on Shindig. Mm-hmm. In fact, there's uh, if you dig hard enough, you can find on YouTube uh, a couple of clips of a very short-haired Leon uh, doing uh, doing Jerry Lee Lewis. Hmm. Um, but you know his real his prime years were in '69, '70, '71, uh, doing production work for Joe Cocker. Uh, and put, as I said, putting together the Mad Dogs and Englishman tour, uh, his, uh, his stint, and in, um, and in fact, his second, his well, his first solo album after he and Denny Cordell uh, formed Shelter Records, his first album for Shelter, uh, George and Ringo played on that album, mm-hmm. and then. The second album, which was released in the spring of 71, uh, included Beware of Darkness, which right. is where the idea came for George and, Re- and Leon to kind of share the, the lead vocal on that in the, uh, in the concert for Bangladesh. Right. And, yeah. and, he, and he continued to be a, a pretty major force uh, f- until probably, I guess, the mid-70s. But then, you know, beyond, he also had a, had a great deal of success in, in the, country, uh, the country world and uh, Americana and on and on. And, uh, and Elton John yeah. uh, is a great admirer of his. In fact, mm-hmm. he kind of uh, brought, uh, brought Leon back uh, into the limelight a couple of, uh, couple of years back. Mm-hmm. For uh, uh, for a kind of a joint uh, a joint album and a tour. The union, yep. the union, yeah, the, the union. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So just a tremendous talent overall, mm-hmm. and uh, and still on classic rock radio, you will yes. hear those few songs, especially from the early seventies. Tightrope being one of them. Yeah. Um, you know, a song for you, which is considered oh, a masterpiece sure. uh, at this point. Joe Cocker's version of Delta Lady. Right, mm-hmm. right. He also uh, co-wrote Superstar yes. with uh, <laughs> Bonnie Bramlett, which is one of my all-time favorite Carpenters recordings, just a, a masterpiece of a song. And um, also This Masquerade, which was a, a major hit for uh, George Benson. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so Steve, how about you? I saw Leon um, at a, at do a day on the green a um, long time ago, and uh, I, I don't remember a whole lot about the show, <laughs> but I did also pick up the album, uh, the Leon Live album, and I hadn't listened to it. I had the vinyl, and I hadn't really listened to it, but I, last night I bought it off of Amazon, and they give you a free MP3 download, and I, I put it on my phone today, and I was listening to it, and I was just blown away. I could not believe how great that live album is, mm-hmm. and I highly, and I highly, highly recommend it. It is, it is awesome. It's it's basically Mad Dogs and Englishmen without Joe Cocker, but it's it's fantastic. <laughs> it's fantastic. I mean, they're, oh, they are. He he just rocks away. And you mentioned Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, Al, I think, mm-hmm. and uh, he he did play with Jerry. He t- apparently toured with Jerry Lee. Yeah. For some for a while, but not I guess for a couple months in mm-hmm. his early career. I mean, the man has had. When I was writing about him last night, I was going through, and I mean, he was part of the Wrecking Crew. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, there was a great story that that the guy who did the Wrecking Crew movie posted online last night. He posted an outtake 
from the movie, and I can't, I can't, ex- I can't say the whole story here. But apparently, Leon came into a, a Phil Spector recording session really drunk one day, and he was messing around on the piano, and Phil was getting ticked. Phil was getting very ticked, and Phil and said, "Don't you know anything about respect?" And Leon looked straight at him and said, "Yeah." <laughs> In other words, he said, he, he, beginning with F, he told him. <laughs> and look at look for that clip on YouTube. It's fantastic. It's hilarious. And but uh. um, I mean, the guy was extremely talented. He, I mean, he just. I remember, you know, listening to the hell out of uh, the Carney album. I loved that album to death. But that Leon Live album is is great, and I think that. That is his, him at his best. And, and I mean, it's it's got the the uh, Jumpin' Jack Flash medley that he did on on uh, Bangladesh, which of course is is just he just took the house down with that. That was just fantastic when he did that mm-hmm. that night. And uh, you know, I mean, it was just he was amazing. He was fantastic. Uh, the uh, uh, people were calling him by his nickname, the Master of Time and Space, mm-hmm. or Space and Time. Yeah. And, and and I mean he he was he was he was something else he was he was great so yeah I mean I was really sad to hear about that yesterday and then on top of Leonard Cohen a couple of days earlier I mean it, mm-hmm. it's been it's been a it's been a bad year uh, you know very yeah. bad year as far mm-hmm. as losing music musicians go uh, yeah well and real real yeah. icons too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Someone on someone on the internet has done a Sergeant Pepper cover with mm-hmm. all of the people who you know actors and and uh, musicians who've died. Plus yeah. the the where the flowers are that say Beatles on Pepper. It says mm-hmm. Brexit. And uh, there's a song. Yeah, that, that was a, it was, it was basically great. British though. They were mostly British. A lot of British uh, yeah. artists. I, yeah. I didn't recognize. Uh, there were a, a, I think there were a few American names that they left off, but yeah. it was basically somebody in England did it. Well, they caught yeah, up with Leonard that. Cohen, and uh, not yet with Leon. I, I imagine by the end of the year, um, I'm waiting for the end of the year to download that one. Mm. <laughs> See what happens because it's already pretty crowded. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and un- un- unfortunately, it's kind of a part of life because a lot yeah. of these. A lot of these artists are, you know, coming coming to a, you know, the age where you know it happens. For, it, where it happens, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Kit, any thoughts from you? Well, um, you know, I, I will say I, I I really was was struck by by, by uh, Liam Russell's death because I I really didn't realize how much I'd kind of grown up with his music and and listening to his music and. And I'll tell you, I mean, as a songwriter, too, I mean, he, he's, of course, a wonderful performer. And, Steve, I'm going to, when we're done here, I'm going to pick up that Leon Live album. That sounds amazing. Um, it, really, it really is. It's fantastic. Yeah. It was done in Long Beach. I think, it, I can't remember what year, early 70s. So. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, it's like 73, 74, somewhere in that neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Yeah, i got to pick that up. But I just think A Song for You is, true, in my opinion, one of the best compositions i mean lyrically it's it's you know if i if i may be you know a little a little mushy here it, it's mm-hmm. really one of the songs that that i it brings me to tears when i when mm-hmm. i hear it and um and and as you said this masquerade i mean you know i mean i i just think what's interesting about him is that you know in his own work he did do quite a bit of of as you said blues uh, you know, down home kind of stuff. But look at how his music could be interpreted in different ways. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, my my favorite version of a song for you, and I, I posted it on my Facebook page this week, was Donny Hathaway. I mean, it's I just mm-hmm. love it. But as I said, Ray Charles did a great version. Uh, this Masquerade, of course, you had George Benson, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, doing a jazz cover. Uh, and Superstar, which I think mm-hmm. is just a masterpiece of storytelling. I mean, right. I, I just... Uh, I mean, it's like a mini play. I mean, I, I just always felt uh, the Carpenters, of course, had the hit with it, but so did Luther Vandross, and I, I love his Rita, version. Rita, too. Rita Coolidge, Rita Coolidge, right. and yeah. Coolidge. Yeah, I mean, look at the the range of people that have performed his his songs, mm-hmm. and it just shows that he could really be a musical chameleon. 
And, uh, you know, it wasn't like you always heard one of his songs and said, oh, yeah, that's a Liam Russell song. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it sometimes was was hard to to detect. But I, I just think he was an absolute I mean, he was so gifted such an incredible songwriter that would just write from raw emotion. And uh, I'm, I'm going to miss him a lot. And, and one other thing that, uh, that the Leon live album, by the way, initially came out when that came out, it was three, three albums. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it was a three vinyl, three vinyl albums. It's two CDs, yeah. I guess now, but uh, I was, when I was listening to it this morning, um, he does a tribute to, he talks about, you know, the people who influenced him and he goes, one of the people that that uh, made me leave my job at Safeway, and I started laughing because, as you guys know, that that's a there's a personal connection there. Mm-hmm. But um, it, but anyway, um, he said it was uh, Little Richard, and he starts doing this great. And I don't know the title of it. I don't have the album in front of me, so I can't tell you the title. But he does this tribute to Little Richard, and he just literally just pounds away on the piano, and it mm-hmm. is absolutely incredible just to. To, to go, he just goes over and over and over again. He he's he was an absolutely brilliant pianist. I mean, he was just, and he had this kind of countryist kind of, uh, and I mean, he played with so many different people. Besides, I, I did you guys mention Willie Nelson? I mean, he he did yeah, a, he did, did a double a double album with Willie right, uh, in the did late seventies. So, I mean, he was just uh, he was really very versatile. I mean. You know, I mean, he was he was amazing. I think we we may have taken him. From, and then he did the and he also did the Hank Wilson persona where he did yes. all the country, the country music stuff. Right. I mean, he mm-hmm. was I mean, he was from Oklahoma, so it's no surprise that he was into country music. But I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, he was I mean, at the time, as I recall, when he did the Hank Wilson stuff, there wasn't really a lot of attention being paid to Hank Williams. At least, at least that's my my uh. thinking. Oh, there was the, uh, there was quite a bit, but I, not not as much as there has been in later years. Right, right. Well, and, and then he he did, I believe, it was four albums total of Hank Wilson, doing other mm-hmm. people, you know, besides Hank Williams, which actually, I, I, which I that's one thing I'm going to have to look for because I'm a a big Hank Williams fan, but. Uh, mm-hmm. Wow, I mean, it's such it's a tra- such a loss, such a, a, ba- a horrible loss, and mm-hmm. uh, and I guess he, he'd had a heart attack in July. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. and he'd been he'd been really he'd been in I guess in bad shape since then. Mm-hmm. Although his wife said in a statement that they released last night that they were that he was hoping to get back on the road in January. So, mm-hmm. oh well. Mm. But anyway, if you can pick up his albums, pick up any of his albums, you know, by all means. The first album has, which we had mentioned, the first album has Ringo and George. And George, right. And Mick Jagger and Charlie mm-hmm. Watts and Bill Wyman. Mm-hmm. And, and Eric, I believe Eric Clapton's on that, too. I mean, he but that was that, that was kind of how much people respected him by they all, you know, in fact, they all showed up for his, for his albums, you know, so yeah, people who were listening to FM radio in the early seventies probably remember roll away the stone. Oh yeah. Right. From that. that album. I, God, I love that. That, that was one of my favorite. I think I, I cranked the hell out of that song more than I care to admit. I mean, and on, and on the live album, it sounds fantastic. He does that mm-hmm. on the live album and it just sounds wonderful. Mm. So, it kind of tells you something when at the concert from Bangladesh, when George is introducing everybody, he says, someone you all know by now, Leon, yeah. <laughs> right. he doesn't even say the last name. It's like yeah. if, you, if you know right. him by the first name, that's recognition right, right there. Yeah. But, right. Um, I had the chance to see him in concert in Connecticut, and he was superb. Um, the one thing, he didn't really have much stage presence in the sense that he didn't talk to the audience at all. It was just banging out one song after another. But the performances were just amazing, and he had great musicians to work with. So, uh, yeah. What year? What I, year was that? Oh, it's got to be over ten years ago. Huh? See, I saw, him, I saw, him, I saw him when that when that live album came out, and he had a lot of stage. Pre- I mean, he was. I mean, if there was some kind of a sex god in rock and roll, he was it. Um, <laughs> Wow, he he was he was yeah. I didn't know you felt that way about him, there, Steve. My goodness, <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. I'm, I'm just saying. I think I, I think there were a lot of um, 
he had a lot of female fans. Let's put it that way. Oh yeah, uh-huh. oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. I remember mm. uh, when I was working uh, working at Sam Goody in the uh, in the in the early seventies. There was one particular girl. It was a cashier who absolutely was over the moon about Leon Russell. Mm. Mm. And mm. not to and 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 I they one of the one of the first reactions I looked for was Chris O'Dell. Who yes. is the subject of uh, the, his song Pisces Apple Lady? Yeah, and, and they, um, uh, the, yeah, she's she writes. If you get the uh, Miss Odell book, uh, he uh, he's in that book. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, yeah, that's it was he he was great. It was, yeah, what a loss. That, that's yeah. all I can. I mean, I you can. We've been saying that a lot this year, but in this particular mm. case, it, it really means something. It really does. Yeah, and I always admire people that really pay their dues. And Leon, just the beginning of his career, you know, mm-hmm. being a session player and being part of the Wrecking Crew and learning about all the people that he worked with. And in particular, I always knew about the Gary Lewis connection, and yeah. I just wanted to look it up. But he he had a hand in uh, co-writing "Everybody Loves a Clown," mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. also "She's Just Ooh. My Style." And oh, sure. uh, you mentioned Frank Sinatra; he played on the "Strangers in the Night" album. Yep. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And he also uh, played on Mr. Tambourine Man. He played on the song yeah. Mr. Tambourine uh-huh. Man. Oh, yeah, so I mean, he was as part of that that Wrecking Crew. I mean, he was all over some of the the greatest songs of the of the era, you know. And mm-hmm. again, shows his versatility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And he also worked with Glenn Campbell, who was part of the Wrecking Crew too. Mm-hmm. I just posted something on Facebook with uh, the two of them doing "Gentle on My Mind" together, and it's just amazing. So. Um, I just want to quickly mention a few of the Beatle connections here, because apart from the concert for Bangladesh, the song Bangladesh, uh, George said that that intro, uh, my friend came to me, was an idea that Leon suggested to him that the, you should tell a story at the very beginning as to why you're doing this. You know, and mm-hmm. so uh, Leon inspired George to uh, come up with the intro of that song. And also where the concert for Bangladesh is concerned, I know I said this before, but one of my favorite moments in the entire show is when uh, George and Bob Dylan and Leon are playing together. Uh, and just like a woman. Doing, oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. And sharing the same microphone. Yeah. It's, uh, it's such a magic moment. You know, I, I equate that with the Beatles when they did This Boy. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. John Paul and George mm-hmm. are on the same microphone. I love that. And certainly the whole... You know, uh, Young Blood, Jumping Jack Flash medley right there was just, uh, you know, an amazing moment there uh, as part of the concert. Just a great performance. But um, Leon also did play on the rock and roll album from John. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, he played on Bad Fingers Straight Up album. It's him playing the piano on Day After Day. And um, with George, the song You actually stems from uh, sessions with Ronnie Spector because it was supposed to be. Uh, written for her to record, right. and to make oh, it yeah. out. Leon Russell was on that. So when you when you look at the credits for you on the Extra Texture album, Leon's on it, Ooh. and he also yeah. plays on Tired of Midnight Blue, the piano mm-hmm. on that. So uh, yeah, a lot of connections there with the Beatles, and you know, overall just a, a tremendous talent and a, and a great loss. Leon Matter Blue. of fact, going back to what you were saying about the uh, about the concert for Bangladesh, mm. the first single that Dylan released after the concert of Bangladesh in the fall of 71 was a record called Watching the River Flow. And the <laughs> the first notes of that record are unmistakably Leon Russell's piano. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Wow. wow. He, had a, he had a sound and a style that was all his own. He really sure close. did. And we will greatly miss him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That we okay, will. So Let's move on to uh, our other topic for the show, and that is talking about Apple, the company Apple, the Beatles company Apple. And uh, you might have noticed that in some of our past shows, we might have been a little critical of Apple here on the show. A little? A little? Uh, maybe no. one particular co-host of mine <laughs> excels in that department, but um, I'm not going to mention any names here. But I thought maybe we'd keep it kind of positive this time. And this was actually Kit's own idea. Thank you, Kit. No. So we thought we'd talk about what Apple has done right to preserve <laughs> the people's legacy. 
and keep it going. So since this was your idea, Kit, why don't we start with you? Get some, mm-hmm. uh, get some thoughts on this. Sure. Well, you know, and yeah, I, I found myself thinking about this because I'm as guilty as, as anybody else of, of putting uh, down Apple. And, and, you know, I found myself doing it again, you know, talking about like the Hollywood Bowl album and so forth. And so I thought this was a good challenge. You know, I, I thought, well, you know, why not talk about what they did? I think that I, I, I like how they have kept up with technology and they realize that they have to reach, you know, new fans on their level. I mean, obviously, you know, they're not compromising, you know, the music in any way, but they're presenting it in different forms. Like, you know, even the rock band. Uh, right. video game, that I thought, and particularly looking back, that was, a, I think, a, a brilliant idea because I remember, and, and I'm sure those of you go to Beatle Fest will remember when they set up the demos that year. You know, they had rooms. Mm-hmm. On, and, it, and it was just wonderful to see these, you know, teenage uh, teenagers enthusiastically playing the game. And, you know, and I thought it was just a, a, a wonderful way to introduce them, but in a, in a format that they're used to. I mean, obviously, gaming is huge, and they're very used to it. It's interactive, which younger generations particularly respond to. And, of course, it was great for, for us longtime fans, too, because they did the wonderful remixes and, and kind of deconstructed the songs. I mean, I, I love that personally. But I just think that was a, a great way to keep, you know, you were saying earlier, Ken, about keeping their legacy alive. Mm-hmm. And I think that was... A, a brilliant way to do it. Um, and today, of course, a little more recently, they finally uh, got to iTunes. Now, I will criticize them a little bit here that I thought they were a little late to the party. However, um, they were smart in that they did build up. I mean, it was heavily hyped um, mm-hmm. when they finally did reach iTunes. I mean, it was a big deal. And, of course, they ended up selling a lot more, you know, people downloaded the music. Um, but, again, it's for, for younger people. And then today, I, I was just thinking about this today with streaming media. You know, now they have reached Spotify and, uh, and the other streaming media services. And this is, again, a way that they're trying to reach younger generations. I was talking about this at the New York Fest this past April. I was on the mm-hmm. Women Historians panel. We were talking about multi-generational fandom, and we talked about how once they hit streaming media, I mean, you know, the number of listens they got was, were just enormous. I mean, the numbers, I, I'd have to see if they have updated numbers, but they were impressive. And for Spotify, some, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because Spotify says that they have had uh, uh, over a billion mm-hmm. streams sure. of, of Beatles songs. Absolutely, and I think that I mean that just shows you that you know the, that the market is still there, that the interest is still there, and a, and a lot of the the people listening are younger fans. But it was interesting. I remember talking about this uh, during this panel, and there were some, not all, but some first generation fans who were really like they did not understand why this was necessary, and they didn't use it, and what was the point, and. You know, I I think it is absolutely crucial now to reach younger fans on their level, you know, through platforms they're used to. And so I think Apple is is doing a great job in keeping up with that kind of technology and preserving their legacy in that way. You know, on, on this particular topic, I just want to say, because um, we brought up the Beatles one time and time again here. And how much of maybe a game changer that album was, because mm-hmm. I really don't think that the Beatles and Apple expected it to be as successful as it was. It was number one all over, all over, you know, the globe, and like 37 countries, and um, you know, it became the biggest selling, you know, album or CD. Yeah, it's I think the big, the, well, the biggest selling uh, album of this century by anyone not named Adele. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good right there. Yeah. But the fact that so many of the people that either bought or were given as presents the Beatles one are a younger 
demographic, yeah. maybe that's what got the ball rolling on this whole thing about trying Absolutely. to attract the young audience. That's a good point, because a lot of the people who bought that album at the time were about my age, and they were in, then playing it for their kids, you know, and it was a way to introduce the band to casual fans, you know, I mean, obviously, I had all the, you know, the albums and, and so forth. I did get one for, you know, completists. But um, but I, I think, um, you know, again, that's a good point, Ken. It's, it's a way to introduce the band to younger generations. And, and that's a good point that that may have gotten the ball rolling. Mm, right. Mm. Can I make a comment? Ken, Please. You were, talking, you were talking about the Beatles not, uh, or the fact that the Beatles got... Uh, um, hooked into technology, the, and but at the same time, like you said, they really waited a long time to get into iTunes, and probably a lot longer than they should have. The fact that it didn't, re- I mean, the fact that they that they've made a lot of money, you know, in the in the interim, I mean, good thing. But at the same time, they probably had they Neil Aspinall was the one that that kept them from it. You know, and well, I, you got to remember they, something else that there was actually for quite some time there was litigation going on between the right. two companies. Yep. You know, right. because no, I mean, you know, that's true too. You know, the Beatles had originally sued Apple Computer. You know, for basically for uh, in, in a sense for you know trademark infringement, and then Apple countersued them. And this went on, went back and forth for for a number of years, and that's probably the main thing that kept uh, the Beatles off of iTunes because Steve Jobs was a huge, massive Beatle fan. Oh, I know he was. And in fact, he used to, uh, when Apple would have their events, uh, when they introduced the iPod, and when they introduced the iPad, when they introduced the iPhone, they they used to, you know, he made sure. That they played Beatles music, even though they didn't have the uh, the rights to uh, uh, for for downloading on, on iTunes. Mm-hmm. And well, Apple, 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 an Apple computer was named after you know Apple Core. I mean, sure, you know, so. exactly. But so I mean that's true. And but again, they could have they could have done this a lot sooner. And and they resisted for whatever reason. I mean, the rumors were that they were looking for more money, and that yeah. may have been. That may have been the case, you know, but mm-hmm. still, uh, I, you know, I, it's a good thing that they finally did it. I mean, there's no question about it. And it's a good thing that they've gone, you know, they've gotten hip to technology. Um, but it, it seemed like for a long time there were, it wasn't going to happen. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Alan, how about you weighing in on this? Yeah, um, if we can go way back historically, I can find Mm -hmm. lots of nice things to say about Apple, because when Apple was formed and started a record label, that record label really was exceptional. If you look at its catalog now, I mean, you know, boy, they had everything. They had the modern jazz quartet. They had John Tavener, the composer, who really didn't become a big thing in the classical music world for a couple of decades after that. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, you know, by the early 2000s, he was extremely hot. But in 1968, he was just sort of starting. Um, so they had two albums of his. And um, I mean, James Taylor, you know, right out of mm-hmm. nowhere. Mm-hmm. Mary Hopkin, right out of nowhere. Um, you know, then they had their avant-garde stuff with the John and Yoko things and George's electronic sounds. I mean, maybe people didn't like them all that much, but it became like, you know, kind of like a playground for them to do other stuff that wasn't the commercial things. Um, and of course, they had the Beatles albums themselves. And I mean, it, it just was, I have a little poster that came out at the time. It must have been a marketing thing. And it shows all the maybe first dozen or more Apple album covers and every mm-hmm. single one of those records is a great record, you know, to this yeah. day. Um, mm-hmm. Jackie Lomax, I mean, you know, there's there, mm-hmm. there, there really were no stinkers, you know, it was it was, um, you know, so so that was great. Um, it, it's a pity that um, probably as a result of the Beatles fracturing themselves that that whole thing just fell apart. 
But, um, you know, so there's that. Okay, that's a positive thing about Apple. The one plus uh, set that came out last year I thought was great, but I would have to footnote that by saying that this was at least like the, the th- what, the third iteration of the one album. The first one was um, apart from being generally useless, and I know the arguments, we just heard mm-hmm. them again, was badly mastered and and uh, brick-walled, as they say. Then they finally replaced the tracks with you know, the remastered tracks, which, okay, now it sounds better at least, but it's still, you know, the one album. Um, and then finally, finally, just a year ago, 15 years after bringing it out for the first time, they put out, you know, a really exceptional set of, you know, all those videos. I mean, they're still missing some videos and Various people have had complaints about this or that. I thought it was really well done. I thought the the restoration on things like the Penny Lane clip and the Strawberry Fields clip and and some of those others was very well done. Um, I can hear voices of some of my more um, erudite fanatical colleagues saying, yes, but they replaced eight frames in the Penny Lane <laughs> video with, with eight <laughs> other frames. And yeah, okay, okay, fine, you know, but... Um, <laughs> You know, but generally speaking, you know, we can now say that those classic videos are out there. It took them way, 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 way too long um, (laughs) because they're too busy focusing on, you know, um, know, getting these, the 14 year olds to hear the hits for the first time. And I have no real problem with that so long as they're also giving the rest of us, the stuff that we would like. Um, Mm -hmm. The rock band thing, um, I wrote, okay, I mean, I've... (laughs) I've sort of made a career of pointing out the stuff they do that's wrong, especially when I was at the Times. And when the rock band um, thing came out, I wrote a little piece for them saying that, you know, basically for people really interested in Beatles music, this is entirely useless, except that even though it is very, very encrypted, it'll take a few months, but we will get those track isolations out yeah. one way or mm-hmm. another. And, right. you know, and, and, and it was done one way or another. I mean, first people would um, actually purposely fail at the game so that only one track would play and they mm-hmm. would record that. <laughs> and then finally it took, I think, eight months to crack the encryption and and people were able to get, you know, everything out. And so unwittingly, Apple put out something that we really, really wanted, which was track mm-hmm. isolation. So that was a good thing, but I don't think they meant to do it. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. What else? Uh they also put out studio fra- uh, uh, the studio fragments in those in those uh, Rockman mixes too. That's right so, too. Yeah. So they right. the so we, we did stuff. get plenty of extra stuff in there. It took an awful lot of work to actually get it because they didn't mean mm-hmm. us to have it, but um, but we have it, and and that's great. And and that has allowed a lot of people who you know are very technically skilled to actually sort of recreate what the session track layouts were, which, you know, the the unencrypted um, rock band tracks themselves don't quite give you, but people were able to say, okay, the, they, they recorded the, the drums and bass together, so this would have been that track, and, you know, and, mm-hmm. and reconstruct those in a, in a really good, useful way. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to think of something else. Um, can you guys think of anything else they've done that I thought? Oh, the anthology, oh. the anthology, oh, yeah. the anthology. <laughs> there's, there's I thought an was oversight. Great. Yeah, really a huge oversight. <laughs> um, because <clears throat> you know the TV series I thought was really well done. The DVDs and or, or VHSs when they eventually came out, and then the DVDs with even more material. That was that was fantastic, and uh, the book, um, you know, all mm-hmm. the different iterations of the anthology, that was a good thing. Now that they're, uh, you know, not to tip our hand, hand too much, because we'll talk about the um, the new one, the eight days a week next week, um, but there's a lot of stuff on the bonus disc that you begin to think, okay, you know what, if they took all the raw material from the anthology, including some of those outtakes, 
and some of these outtakes and re-edited the whole thing. You're you're beginning to get a mm-hmm. multi-perspective. Um, I I wasn't you know I wasn't going to say anything about too much about that, but you're right, and I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, um, you know, you could have you can have an anthology that would run you know two hours a day for six years. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd be happy with that, you know. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so okay. I, that's that's probably about as much as I can think. Oh, you know, the remastering of the of the albums in two thousand nine. Again, it took them way too long, but I thought those were carefully done and and was happy to have them. And then the mono reissues on vinyl. Mm-hmm. That was a lot of fun actually to play those in that format. So there were little things here and there, but you know, there's always so much more that we want. You know that yes. that it, it oh, seems like they're not giving us, you know, what we're expecting mm-hmm. each time. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. It, it seems natural for you, Steve, to just bounce off of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, as- actually, a couple of a couple of the ideas I had kind of bounce off what Alan said. Um, Alan was talking about the the mono release, the mono vinyl act. The mono CDs, because I thought that was fantastic. Um, I also put down the Apple CD box because I thought that was uh, that goes back to what you said about uh, Alan about how great the the catalog was um, because that box was fantastic. But I had a couple. I mean, I, I also had a couple of other releases. I thought Yellow Submarine soundtrack was mm. wonderful. I also thought Let It Be Naked was wonderful and i've said before that i didn't like it in the beginning but after listening to it over and over and listening to the, how well how well it sounded i think that that was really good too but i also have two other things i'll go to the first one first because it, again again it bounces off what you just were saying about um about uh, the movie you know that we're going to talk about next week the whole between one plus and eight days a week it seems to me that Ringo is getting more of a more of a spotlight, and I think that's a great. I think that's a great thing. Mm-hmm. I think it's the thing. And one one thing one thing that and I, uh, and I'm going to probably tip a, a hand here. Uh, and Alan, tell me if you if you agree. Ringo says a lot in the special features on the movie, and some of his opinions are not stuff I've heard before. And it's so great to hear him talk about not just himself. But about everybody else, mm-hmm. and give his and his views, and yeah. I think that's and let's make it clear. I mean, everybody's always kind of pushed Ringo to the back, like he doesn't know what he's talking about. He does, he yeah. does know. Yeah, and and I'm so glad to see Ringo get you know get some kind of uh, credit now, and and uh, it's it's long long overdue. The other thing though is the whole nine nine oh nine thing. Not just the remastering, because the remastering, of course, was the reason, but the fact that it brought the Beatles back out into the spotlight again. And um, I know they've we've had little instances, you know, here there, you know, since we had the Eight Days a Week movie actually that that kind of brought them out again. But really, nothing has been like the nine nine oh nine, and that was that was huge. And they, you know, that brought them brought everybody together again and that and uh, you know the, it gave everybody a chance to celebrate them again we we'll loved it and, too a bit right right true um but yeah i mean the the whole the idea that the beatles are cool again is 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 mm-hmm. awesome and and it's yeah. not it's not just the fact that you know they are what they are because we know that but the fact that everybody else realizes that and they haven't you know i mean cuz easily the fact that I mean they're you know as old as they are the Beatles could have dropped off the public uh, you know view and they haven't um, so that's you know it's a credit to both Apple and it's a credit to the fans actually too so you can you can look at it from both sides but what do you um, mean cool again they were always cool it's just yeah, other people and, hadn't and, caught and, up and, with the fact that they were. <laughs> And, well, you know, when it, when it, and as I was saying earlier, I mean, they they have the single biggest selling album of this century, as I said, by anybody not named Adele. You know, it's so it's not as if they've faded away into history. They've been very much in the forefront. You know, there's all these Breakfast at the Beatles shows that run all over the country. And there are, you know, there are... <laughs> 
numerous uh, th- you know numerous Beatles podcasts. You know what we do. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's not as it's not as if they've you know faded into history. They they really have never really disappeared. No, but in, in, on that particular on that particular day, they took over. They took well, over yeah, me. that was yeah, that was absolutely that's an that's event. what I'm that's what I'm that's what I'm kind of talking about. Yeah, and that doesn't that, was, that doesn't happen. That doesn't yeah, happen. It, was, it didn't happen. Go ahead, Ken. There's never been a time when they faded away, but there have been periods when, you know, there hasn't been much talked about them, and their record sales weren't mm-hmm. as great. And like yeah. for example, in the early '80s, you had. You know, those compilations that came out like Real Music and the Beatles' 20 mm-hmm. Greatest Hits, they mm-hmm. didn't do that well. No. And then there was really nothing until uh, Live at the BBC, really. So you're dealing with over a decade there when you didn't hear about new releases of Beatle music at all or compilations of any kind. Right. But they were always looked upon. You know, everybody respected them for what they achieved. But, you know, there are, there's always going to be moments when they're in the spotlight and people are talking about them again. There was a time there in the '80s and early '90s when it, I don't believe it was that way. I think, they always I think, there. I think, They're always there. I think we, I think we, mm-hmm. have, I think we tend to look at it more from inside our bubble. I mean, for us, they're always there. Not for everybody else. On nine nine oh nine, they were there for everybody. Period. Mm-hmm. I, I do think remember. That's, that's I, I, yeah, I think it was '87 when they came out on compact disc. When the whole mm-hmm. uh, when all their albums. Right. Yes. And that, and that, that was, was pretty also. big. That was a pretty yeah. big deal at the time. Mm-hmm. And it, of course, well, and that <laughs> we're now getting into criticizing Apple again because of course that proved to be controversial I remember that Mm -hmm. about you know the early albums being you know that they chose to stick with the original mono and oh my gosh I remember the letters that were sent in to Beatle fan that complained that the channels Mm -hmm. were reversed and I mean it was it was really controversial I remember Alan's interview with George Martin yeah (laughs) right exactly uh, yeah so those yeah. were the days. <laughs> yeah. Those were the days. Those were the days. Al, Al, how about you? What would you What would you pinpoint as being major moments? Well, the uh, actually, legacy? I think I have one item left on here, which <laughs> which you guys haven't already covered, uh, and you may have. Uh, Alan actually may have uh, mentioned it anyway, and that's the the Yellow Submarine song track. Steve did. I, 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 I oh, you that. did. That came out mm-hmm. in nineteen in nineteen ninety nine, mm-hmm. which uh, was uh, you know uh, uh, certainly for uh, for people who have made the case that the entire catalog needs to be needs to be remixed. Obviously, the Yellow Submarine song track shows shows what can be done with the catalog. You know, mm-hmm. not that it was not that it was that huge a uh, you know a commercial success. It certainly wasn't the commercial success that one would be the following year. Mm-hmm. But um, but it certainly uh, it showed what you know what could be done as far as upgrading uh, upgrading the sound. Uh, Ken very briefly touched on the uh, the first Live at the BBC album, which mm-hmm. kind of appeared almost out of nowhere with very little notice at the end of November of, uh, of, of 1994. And that kind of, you know, first of all, it had been, people had been clamoring for some kind of official release of at least a portion of the bead tracks obviously by that time the great dane box had already come out which was mm-hmm. the you know the mm-hmm. the the big the big kahuna bbc bootleg of the of the, at least that uh, that time uh, and obviously there uh, and i can recall alan going into great depths about this about the um uh, the sound problems with the with the BB the first BBC album because of the no noise um, mm. situation that was in vogue at that time. But apart from that, it still it was the first you know collection of the Beeb material that had come out commercially, and and it kind of served almost as a prelude to the the anthology project, which rolled out almost exactly a year later. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and and 
going back to uh, kind of following up on what Alan was saying about the the original Apple Records catalog, uh-huh. um, you know, really, even though the the catalog isn't really that extensive, note for note, it is it's an outstanding catalog, uh, a very diverse. Um, as Alan mentioned, there were, you know, there were legitimate stars that came out of uh, the Apple years. James Taylor being ob- the most obvious one. Badfinger probably being the other one. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Billy the other, Preston. The, the other ma- major one, Billy Preston. Although, of course, Billy had his. Uh, well, of course, James Taylor had his greatest success after Apple, but so did Billy Preston as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but it uh, from you know from Doris Troy to the Radha Krishna Temple to the Sundown Playboys to Chris Hodge to David Peel to Mary Hopkin, they the label was all over the to the modern jazz quartet. Uh, the Raga soundtrack, uh, various various and sundry other things. Uh, Apple was all over the the map musically and virtually everything that the label uh put out was of of a very high quality and um and then uh in 1990 i guess well beginning in 1991 they began rolling out cd reissues of the well not even reissues cd issues of the the apple the non beatles apple catalog and they did uh, once again. They did. They did actually a a pretty good job. Uh, unfortunately, Capital kind of co- co-opted uh, the situation because since uh, I think they were expecting, particularly the James Taylor album and the Badfinger albums, to sell a lot better than they actually did, and so Capital ended up basically dropping out of the the project i guess maybe about halfway through so the 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 last couple of batches of the the reissues in 93 and 94 and 95 um were uh, were you know had to be obtained as imports from Ooh. from emi uh but they did they did actually a, a pretty a pretty good job with those reissues, and then perhaps even though they didn't roll out the complete catalog, they probably did a better job in um, in 2010. Yeah. In October of 2010, with the the 17 albums that they did reissue, plus that wonderful "Come and Get It" Best of Apple Records mm-hmm. compilation, mm-hmm. which included a lot of things, a lot of singles that. You know, had never appeared on Apple albums. Things like Thingamy Bob, uh, things like the Sundown Playboys single, uh, Chris Lana, Hodge, Chris Hodge, Lana Derrick Van Eaton, mm-hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think they did, uh, uh, you know, a very good job there. Uh, of course, the anthology, uh, you know, the entire, the entire scope of the anthology project. You know, not just no. You know, not just the broadcast and uh, video and DVD, uh, and even the director's cut versions of the of the film, but also the three double CD anthology uh, audio discs, all of which went to number one. That's right. And 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 plus also, as Alan mentioned, the book. Uh, so certainly. Certainly, the anthology project has to be has to be considered as a major uh, a major success uh, mm-hmm. for Apple. And as Steve mentioned, definitely the uh, uh, the nine oh nine oh nine event with the uh, the release of the two the two box sets of the the stereo and mono Beatles catalog plus the rock band of uh, discs. And uh, and also the 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 release of the the stereo album separately, all of that on the same day. It really was a uh, uh, definitely a uh, uh, an event. And uh, we did touch, I think, on love as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, so that certainly, I think that certainly has to be a uh, a positive. Mm-hmm. And you, you know, thought you had nothing to add there, Al. <laughs> well, well, a lot of this is really going back on, you know, kind of yeah. reinforcing what you guys have been saying. 
Right. Yeah, if if I could just touch on just one thing you said, Alan, because mm-hmm. I had it on my list too, and and Alan, I think you you hit the nail on the head about this too when you were talking about the albums that Apple originally issued, and and I think Alan, you said you know they weren't really commercial, and yeah, I think that's one of their main that one of their strengths. I mean, you know, Al, you just talked about how diverse uh you know their their uh you know lineup was mm-hmm. their clientele. And, you know, these are people that who knows if they could have gotten record deals. I mean, you know, as talented as James Taylor was and is, you know, he didn't fit into any category. I mean, you know, who knows if, if you know would have I mean I'm sure the Apple connection helped him eventually, you know, really gain fame. But Apple mm-hmm. took the chance on him. You know, mm-hmm. and and I think that I just think that was an absolute strength that uh, and that really became kind of a, a maverick label that they were able to take on these these definitely non-commercial acts. Because let's face it, the Beatles could have done that. I mean, they could have set up their mm-hmm. own label and said, hey, let's let's produce some hits. You know, let's let's listen mm-hmm. to what's uh, going on on the charts and then let's let's find some bands that sound like that and the way you go. I mean, they, you know, of course they wanted to make money, but they they were also interested in nurturing talent. And so absolutely, I think that was one of Apple's main strengths. I just love the fact that we're bringing this up because I don't think the Beatles get nearly enough credit for their own record company and signing all these acts. I think that the the artists that the Beatles brought to Apple were really an extension of themselves mm-hmm. and giving themselves the chance to to uh, put out music or art that they might have wanted to do but probably couldn't get away with as much in the Beatles. Mm-hmm. The fact that John and Yoko could do all the avant-garde stuff that they did you know, George Harrison could put out one to wall music where it's almost all Indian music, whereas on a Beatle album, he'll get one Indian track. Or he could produce the Radha Krishna Temple. You know, he could do that. They could all fulfill a lot of their own artistic ambitions through other artists. And, um, you know, like you said, it's so diverse, all the artists that were on Apple, and they deserve a ton of credit for that. And, and not only that, um, in the early days, they were actually hands-on. You know, you've got Paul McCartney playing bass on the James Taylor album on some songs. Mm-hmm. You've got, you've got George Harrison on uh, Jackie Lomax's. You've and Doris Troy and Billy, Billy Preston. Preston. Yeah. You know, so uh, you also have. I mean, I, 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 I think they intended these to be commercial releases, um, and I think that. They were in in a lot of ways. I mean, a lot of those early Apple albums had hit singles off them, and um, not only that. When, you know, once you began to hear, I mean, okay, maybe not everybody in the world is as crazy as some of us, but once you began to hear that Paul's playing bass on that, George is playing guitar on that, you kind of went out and bought the album to hear that too. And then yeah. if you were turned on to the, you know, to the performer and, and you also, you know what, a lot of these albums, because they were on Apple, it came with kind of an endorsement, you know, the Beatles wouldn't yeah. assign these guys and the Beatles were, you know, they were, they had to okay everything, even if they didn't bring them into the label, even if they didn't sit there and listen to the demo tapes, which I think in some cases they did, it's still they signed off on it, and so it being on Apple was an endorsement, and, and that's something that no other label has had. I mean, you know, you could say, well, okay, Reprise Records was Frank Sinatra's label, but you didn't get the idea that, you know, Jimi Hendrix was signed because Frank Sinatra thought he was great, you know. Right. Um, <laughs> You know, whereas, you know, here with, with Apple, you've got, a, it's an artist-led label, and anything that's on it, you've got to assume is personally endorsed by them, and that's, it, when it's the Beatles, I mean, that's a big deal. That's a good point right there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As far as all of, um, you know, all the Apple releases, I have very little criticism to make for any of it, because I think most of it was well done. I especially love the BBC uh, double CDs that came out. And even though there was that no noise problem in the very beginning, in terms of the actual material, it was fantastic. That first Live at the BBC was an amazing collection to put out. Mm -hmm. And uh, between that and On Air, you know, I'm sure that there are many people listening who wish there'd be the box set of everything. Sure, of Uh, course. But if you you (laughs) have to whittle it down to four CDs, I think, uh, you know, you got the best of the bunch. But why do you have to whittle it down to the four CDs? 
You know, well, you don't have to. You can do what you want. You're the Beatles. Well, I agree with that, and I wish that you know the record company would feel that way. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, that's that's another topic that we hammered to the ground here. On yes. The show, as, the, as far as you know, <laughs> who is your audience? Are you trying to appeal to the hardcore fan that wants everything, or do you want to appeal to a mainstream crowd? Um, you know, I love all these releases. Like love, love can attract. Uh, you know, young fans to the Beatles just by mm -hmm. seeing it in Las Vegas. Yep. You know, it, you can win over new fans that way. And, um, you know, Let It Be Naked was fine, but I like what Steve said. First of all, the, the sound quality on Let It Be Naked is fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really sounds so crystal clear. Whether or not you think, you know, it was worth their while to do it for a few songs that really had the Phil Spector production behind it, you know, there's only like four songs on Let It Be where Phil Spector did a, a lot. Mm -hmm. and even then, I would even question a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, Yellow Submarine song track, I loved a lot. Um, you know, most of it was fine. And I, I do like the fact, as Kit has said, that they are trying to appeal to a younger demographic. And one thing that I haven't mentioned here on this show is that about a week after Eight Days a Week, um, was released in theaters. I got to attend the Q&A at the college where I do my Beatles show, Every Little Thing, and Jeff Jones was there, the CEO of Apple, and he took a Q&A from the audience. And one question that we've addressed here on this show regarding eight days a week is, why is it Hulu picked it up instead of Netflix? And Jeff, so Jeff Jones said, clear out. They have a younger audience. So... Mm -hmm. The Beatles yep. are very much aware of this, and Apple is very much aware of this. Hmm. And when you think about it, yes, there's so much unreleased stuff on the Beatles that I would love to see come out, and I think eventually a lot of it will. But to me personally, as time goes on, what's more important than the Beatles' legacy continuing by having new generations find the music? And you've got to do so much to get them, to bring them to that music. However method you do it, I'm all for it. Yep. So, um, you know, eight days a week, I'm sure there are a lot of people who thought, well, it was supposed to have so much unreleased footage of the Beatles live and there wasn't enough for a lot of people and it was more geared towards a mainstream audience, maybe a younger audience. Well, that could be a good thing because if it leads to them wanting to investigate the Beatles catalog, what's more important than that? As time goes on, it gets more and more difficult for any artist, you know, the veteran artist, for people to discover older and older music so whatever apple can do in that direction i'm i applaud them for that reason mm -hmm. i agree absolutely all right so anybody want to add anything a, a dissenting opinion mr cozen no no i mean I, I i don't disagree i just think that you know maybe they need to employ more people so that you can have one group of people doing all of the new stuff that we've all been buying on bootleg all these years and would be perfectly happy to buy from Apple. Um, and one group of people working on how to attract this year's 12 year olds. Mm -hmm. The problem. I'm all for that too. The, we, the, the there's biggest, nothing wrong with trying to attract both audiences. Yeah, yeah. It's just that they can only do one thing at a time, and that's a big frustration, you know, that, that, that if, like, once you see that it's going to be sort of a mainstream new audience kind of project you realize that that's for it for the year for a while you know okay so that's it for the year but um you know we're sort of running out of years here some of us <laughs> and uh you know I, I'd well like to... one thing you got to remember though is that unlike most of its history apple is no longer autonomous you know they're now just simply part of the universal music group Right, and unfortunately, they call oh, they call the shots. Yes and, uh, and no. Mm, yes okay. and no. The deal is that Universal has the right of first refusal. Mm -hmm. Apple could put together a monster project, and if Universal didn't want it, it could go to Sony. Mm. Mm. They probably don't, you know, want to think about that because that gets a bit messy. But that's the yeah. whole deal. That's the whole reason that we're not getting annual 50th anniversary, you know, reissues issues of unreleased stuff the way Dylan is doing it. I mean, he's doing it because he's happy to do it. 
because basically <laughs> this simply preserves the copyright for the record company, not for the artist. Right. The, yeah, the copyright exactly. reverts to the artist anyway, and the deal that Capital, uh, that, that uh, I guess Universal and Apple made was, okay, we don't feel like putting these things out now, and rather than have Universal lose the copyright as such, the deal will be that if we want to put out a package, Universal has the right of first refusal. But if they refuse, Apple is a free agent. Mm. Very interesting. interesting. They could mm. shop yeah. around. They could mm -hmm. shop around their own products. They could, mm. you know. And looking at what Sony's doing with Dylan, I would think that they would be happy to have, you know, the complete BBC archives come out if Universal doesn't want to do it. Mm. I don't know if I, I can't see Paul and Ringo wanting that. No. Why? <laughs> Why? It's not embarrassing. I mean, they're good performances all the way through. I. Uh, we feel that way. I don't know if they would. You know, they probably they're probably thinking that they want something that commercially would sell very well, that would make the Beatles look good, you know, and will would also appeal to younger people to keep that legacy growing. Hmm. That's I think they're thinking that way too. I they, could be wrong. But. They need to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> The bottom I, line I, behind this, this whole conversation is the Beatles need to talk to Alan. Right. That's what this whole right. thing's all about. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I actually think, I actually think um, that uh, Paul and Ringo have differing views. I think Ringo is a little more commercial than Paul is, but on, on Beatle releases, uh, not necessarily on his own and on his music, but I think on Beatle releases, I think be a little looser on in, that. In, in what way? Well, I think Paul's a little more open-minded as to what he would what he would uh, go for. Probably Yoko too. I think you know. Whereas I think Ringo is more interested in just straight uh, commercial stuff, com more commercial releases. And, I mean, you could go back and talk. And, I mean, we can do this next week when we talk about the DVD. But the whole idea of uh, I'd love to hear the conversations that went into the making of eight days a week and what everybody was thinking. I, I, I think that would be quite interesting. Mm. Uh, I can see I, what no. you're saying there, Steve, because Paul, you know, in, in recent years, every now and then he keeps bringing up carnival of light. He'd like mm -hmm. to see that come out. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if he's saying that just so that, you know, gets his name in the, in the press again for bringing up the Beatles for something. Uh, <laughs> but he has brought it up. Which, by the way, I don't particularly want to hear. Um, yeah, but, I'm not no. clamoring for that. <laughs> no, not no. at all. I mean, oh. uh, there are other things. And I think, that, as I've said before, I think the scrutiny and the reaction to it would be so negative. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, they'd be sorry they even put it out there. So I, I really wouldn't want to see that. But, no. I, but I, I, I just seem to think that Paul would be looser in terms of, you know, more. I, I hate to say more liberal, but I think more liberal. I think Ringo's Ringo's more narrow-minded in terms of of what he what he would bring out. I mean, look at his music, look at what he look at the All Star Band. I mean, that's a fairly narrow concept. I, I can't see. Whereas whereas Paul's Paul tries more uh, different things. So I don't know. Whatever. Well, and yeah, I but... and and I just have to. I would say one more thing that uh, that Al, uh, thank you for bringing up the Great Dane um, BBC. Yeah. Really. Oh boy, <laughs> boy, you just took me down memory lane. Oh man. God, I mean, yeah. That and Yellow Dog, and oh my gosh, those were some of the first when I first started getting into bootlegs. So huh. oh, mem the, memories, the, the, thank the, you. The great, the Great Dane, was a great story for me because. I managed to I, – I got a hold of somebody that, that uh, had one, and I, it was just before Christmas. And there was going to be a tight squeeze uh, to get it to me by Christmas, and I got it. And mm. uh, so that was – because I all of a sudden I went out on my porch, and there was this package. And I went, oh, no, I know what this is. And <laughs> sure enough, it was. I ended up hearing from the guys who made it at some point because um, I think they appreciated the fact that when I reviewed the BBC set for the Times, I um, compared it negatively to the Great Dane re 
release. <laughs> right, um, I remember that. And um, well, Capital was apparently not happy. Great Dane really oh. was. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> so, bet. I, I, did they put you on your on their mailing list right after that? No, they didn't actually. Strangely enough, but um, mm. yeah, they didn't do too much stuff after that. Really, I was going to say, yeah. Uh, but um, the, but then my editor ended up. My editor um, for that story used to take the bus from New Jersey into New York to you know to go to the Times Building and was on the same bus as the publicist for Capital. And she actually came up to him and said, it's not fair having Alan review these things because he really knows the material. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. A publicist's conception of a music critic's job. <laughs> not know the stuff and just say it's good. <laughs> right. Wow. Have, have John wow. Rockwell review it instead or something. <laughs> so... All right. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. And um, what we would like to do is each of us tell you folks how you can get in contact with us. Why don't we start with Steve? You can get me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com or on my Facebook page and my Beatles News Group, Beatles News and Commentary. All right. Al, how about you? Facebook, Al Sussman, Twitter, at A-S-U-S-S-49. And one very quick plug, because it involves one of the affiliates that carries uh, uh, things we said today, uh, Alan Haber's Pure Pop Radio. Uh, a couple of weeks back, uh, we had a lovely afternoon on Skype uh, recording uh, one of his in-conversation shows, and that will be, uh, that will be running on uh, November 22nd at 8 p.m. Uh-huh. So a week from a week from Tuesday as we're taping okay. this. All right. I'll have to listen to that one. The first show was great, Al. Yeah, uh, uh, Alan gave me a concept uh, of uh, picking out between 1964 and 1969 a number one song from each year and a song that I th- that I thought should have been a number one song. Hmm. For each year. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Interesting idea. Okay. Alan, how about you? Okay, you can get to me on Facebook um, at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And on Twitter, um, just at Symbol Cozen. And how about you, Kit? Uh, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter, uh, handle Kit O'Toole. And you can also uh, check out my website at kitotool.com. And as for me, Ken Michaels, you can email me at everylittlething at att.net. You can also check out my Facebook page at Ken Michaels. And then there's my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. Be sure to look at my Beatles trivia and games page, because every week you can win one of nine prizes, one of which happens to be Kit's book called No Way! Singing. (laughs) Yes. In fact, (laughs) Kit told me before the show that I can keep it on that page permanently. You you bet. Absolutely. As long as you want, man. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So this has been great. This has been an incredible conversation. And Kit, thanks so much for being here again. And Mm -hmm. we welcome you sometime soon in the future. Always a pleasure. Thanks so much. (laughs) All right. For Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, Alan Cozen, Dr. Kit O'Toole, and myself, Ken Michaels, you've been listening to Things We Said Today. Thanks for listening. And... We will see you next time.